The last time we talked about asan, we started with verse 46 of chapter 2. We briefly touched upon it and I explained to you that asan should be still and sukham. Still is steady and sukham is comfortable. Still sukham asanam. So it implies already very clearly here that you're talking about static postures and not dynamic postures like in gymnastics. And there are essentially two kinds of asans, cultural and meditative. Cultural asans cultivate a bhava or an attitude. And unfortunately, when asans are done, or practiced dynamically, this, these bhavas or attitudes do not come, come through. Possibly the only attitude that comes through a little bit is the fourth one, Ashwarya, that is confidence or achievement, perhaps in a little bit more distorted way, a little bit more egoism in it. So, modern yoga is not what this is talking about here in the Yoga Sutras. Mostly it is of course referring to asana as in a seat, the seated posture. In colloquial Sanskrit or in even in very high form Hindi, one would ask somebody to, if I would translate it literally, Take asan means take a seat. Take the asan, take a seat, or it implies here mostly meditative postures such as sukhasan, siddhasan, and many others like um, svastikasan, padmasan, etc. We go to the verse 47 and this explains here by relaxation of effort and meditation on the infinite asan is perfected. So now we're talking about asan siddhi. Asan siddhi does not mean perfecting a contortion of kinds or some gymnastic kind of pose, which may be very difficult, but it's quite different from asan siddhi here. It means sitting still and meditating on the infinite. And by relaxation of effort, it means effortlessness. It does not mean you stop the effort, but it means that you begin to feel so comfortable in that position, that it does not cause aches or pains, you're not moving, you're perfectly steady. Stir Sukham Asana. And when you are sitting steady and comfortable, then you are sitting effortlessly. There's a certain relaxation. Whenever there's effort, there's tension in the body. So you force yourself to sit in a certain posture then there's tension. When there's tension, you cannot meditate. So, meditation in an asan or a posture is only possible when there's also certain level of proficiency in that posture so that you're relaxed and you're not continuously thinking about the aches and pains in your, in your uh, muscles which are being stretched or the, the feet that have cramps in it or the back that is paining. The mind doesn't keep going to all these areas but can focus on the object of concentration. And when you are able to do that, you can also meditate on the infinite. What is the infinite? It sounds so grand and if I would try to meditate on the infinite, it, I must admit it's, it's hard. Infinite 
implies that consciousness within us. It is not possible to hold infinity or the idea of consciousness in dynamic postures. When you are doing dynamic movements, you cannot focus on your attention on the subtler consciousness within. There are many um, forms of traditional practices, for example, Tai Chi, um, that people say are very meditative. Meditative is different from meditation. You can say that a jam or um, is, is very fruity, but the jam is not fruit. It tastes fruity, doesn't mean it's fruit. Similarly, Tai Chi and dynamic asanas may be meditative, but they are not meditation. To be able to sit in meditation, you need to be sitting in a steady posture, which is comfortable, which is effortless, and then that can lead us to the higher levels of practice. So quite clear that the Yoga Sutras is not referring to dynamic postures of any kind. It is referring to pre preparing the body for practices of higher meditation. Any questions so far? Often I'm asked this question, yeah, sitting in dynamic postures, uh, sorry, sitting in meditative postures or even practicing asanas in a more static form is not enough. We need movement and uh, that keeps us healthy. Quite true. It is important to have movement to keep the body healthy. In fact, we even say that if you're sitting in meditation, for longer times, the ratio of sitting to movement should be one to four, which means if you would sit for one hour, you should move around for four hours. This includes all household activities, um, walking, whatever, you know, leading an active life. It doesn't mean going for a walk or jogging for four hours. It will also include that, of course, but it's not only that. So there is a great deal of emphasis on movement. It's important for a healthy body. So for those who really want to practice meditation and practice asanas in a more static way so that they can achieve asan siddhi and be able to sit for longer periods of time, they should balance out this sitting by doing other forms of exercise such as jogging, going to the gym, you can play some games like tennis where there's a lot of movement. So these kind of exercises or even dynamic asanas provide a healthy body, they give you flexibility, but they do not lead to purification of the mind. They will not lead to a one-pointed mind. So even if you do six hours of dynamic asanas every day, you will have to deal with your personality, with your mind. There, you will not see much change there. You will see a change in the personality in the mind only if you sit still in meditation and learn how to, to purify the mind. Verse 48. When the 
Asana is effortless and motionless, the mind is meditating on the infinite, then all dualities are transcended. So, this basically implies that when you are really motionless, the mind focusing on the infinite means going beyond dualities. You may wonder, just by practicing this, something which is a little bit more physical, how one can go beyond duality. It's an interesting thought, but imagine all these, the yamas, niyamas, asana and pranayam, all the different aspects of the ashtanga yoga. These are the eight limbs. These are all like gateways. Mastery in any of these can lead to the highest. So to say, it takes you through. Any of those doors could open up and take you through to give you an insight of the infinite within you. That infinite that you are carrying around in you, that is pure consciousness. And that is what you are. That is your true nature. And to emphasize the fact that the asan they're talking about is effortless and motionless. It's not referring to dynamic asanas. So we come to our next group of verses in chapter 2 verses from 49 to 53 and these are on pranayam. Verse 49 says, On this asan siddhi being accomplished, pranayam which is a succession of exhalation and inhalation follows. So once you have attained asan siddhi, you're sitting there motionless, you're sitting there in a steady posture, very comfortably, then pranayam can be accomplished. And what is pranayam? It is defined as the succession of exhalation and inhalation. So pranayam is not breathing exercise. Breathing exercises are very superficial. Pranayam is deeper. The breath is not prana. The breath is far more gross than prana. Prana is far subtler. And prana is the life force itself. So pranayama is control or the mastery over the life force. Breath is also known as vayu. And it is actually at a very superficial level. Right? Prana is at all planes. These aspects, uh, this aspect of pranayam has been gone into great detail uh, in my book. I have explained this in great detail in my book, Mastering Pranayam. And uh, it covers practices like Sushumna Kriya, Sandhya Kriya, and these which take you towards pranayam, exhalation and inhalation is stops at that point of time. It stops or ceases spontaneously. Verse 50 explains Pranayam, it is external, internal, or stops spontaneously. 
It is regulated by space, time, and count. It becomes dirga or elongated and sukshma or subtle. So pranayam is external and it is called bhaya, something like bhaya kumbhak. Internal is abhyantara. It's a form of kumbhak where you re retain the breath. And then there is one which stops spontaneously, that is Keval Kumbhak or called Stambha. It stops just naturally. If you sit for a longer time in meditation in a still position, this may happen just spontaneously. You may feel, oh, I'm having difficulties breathing. And you don't quite understand why that's happening. But that is because of this process of going beyond dualities, of going within the mind. It is regulated in terms of space. That means you have the breath in a certain space. It could be the diaphragm. The nasagri, which is the space between the two nostrils. It could be along the spine, like in Sushumnakriya. Then it is regulated according to time, which means that inhalation and exhalation should be equal, equal breathing. And the third one is count. Count means to elongate the breath, to increase the count of your inhalation as well as exhalation. So to give you an example, the average person breathes in about two to three seconds and breathes out around two or three seconds. But what you want to achieve in practice, not necessarily in daily life, is to keep increasing or elongating the breath so that you're able to breathe in gradually over a period of time, maybe 10 seconds in and 10 seconds out, 15 seconds in and 15 seconds out eventually. And if that's your capacity, you can stop there. That's also good enough. And what you have achieved is you have elongated your breath. The breath becomes the svasa. Svasa it's called. Svasa is breath. So here we're not talking about pranayam, but simply the breath, svasa, becomes dirgha, elongated. And it becomes sukshma, that is very subtle. This too has been explained in great detail in my book. For those of you who have it, it would be very nice if you would write review. And you will find that what is in the book matches completely with what the Yoga Sutra talks about. These are traditional practices. So that's very important, Dirga Svasam. Dirga Sukshma Svasam. You need to have a breath that's elongated and subtle, very fine. The pranayam that goes beyond the domain of external and internal is the fourth pranayam. So now we are no longer talking about retention and suspension of breath. It has gone beyond that. It's neither inside nor outside. So it is also a form of secession of breath, but it is leading to prana itself. We get a direct insight into what this is. Verse 52, and from this fourth pranayam, the veil covering the light is thinned. So you begin to, to have glimpses of what Adiprana is. We experience the joy from the deeper koshas because now we are talking about prana itself. 
Remember that all of this is prana. Everything is prana. So if you use our diagram here, you might get a better idea. That we are talking about This is breathing. That's where breathing is happening here at this level. It's between the body and the conscious mind. Between body and the conscious mind here. The breath is the bridge. But as you experience pranayama, the fourth pranayama, that's somewhere here. This is Adi Prana, right here. So you can see it's really close to the center of consciousness. This is the link, actually, between the center of consciousness and our mind. This is what holds us together. So you can see that pranayama, too, is a gateway and can lead us to the highest. Any questions here? Okay, in that case, we come to verse 53. So when you have developed such a fine concentration, this kind of pranayam, dirga and sukshma, dirga sukshma, elongated and very fine breath, helps make the mind one-pointed. And this one-pointed mind is now fit for higher meditation. So it makes it fit for dharna. It also leads the mind inwards. So now the mind is one pointed inwards and not running outside somewhere, it's going inwards. Verses 54 to 55, Pratyahar. We are almost at the end of chapter 2. Pratyahar. The word Pratyahara is very interesting. Pratya comes from Prati, which means against or opposing, that which opposes. And Ahar means food. What is the food they are referring to? Food for thought, I like to say. All the objects of the world are food for the senses. The senses feed upon these objects of the world. And Pratyaha is against or opposing this food or the objects of the world, which means that the Indriyas, cognitive and active senses, recede from the objects of the world. They detach themselves from these objects. They are not that focused on these objects. Or you can say they lose interest to a certain extent. The coloring has decreased and the mind withdraws inwards. The, the indriyas follow the nature of the mind. The mind by nature, when it is not outwards pulled into the external world, the mind by nature is very contemplative. So the process of withdrawing the senses from these external objects is an interesting process. You can get there by cultivating a certain healthy lifestyle, balanced lifestyle. That's what we talked about in Yamas and Niyamas. You can still the body and refine the breath so that the mind is calmer and the senses are calmer. And then the mind goes inwards naturally and becomes contemplative. So that process is called Pratyahara. 
While this process of pratyahar can be achieved in a session, as I would say, through a systematic practice going from external to internal, it is also an ongoing process in which you are constantly training your senses and the four aspects of your mind so that they do not keep going outward. The four aspects of the mind being manas, buddhi, chitta, and ankara. Manas, of course, includes the, the indriyas, the senses. So when the identities don't continuously lead you outwards, if you have an identity saying, I'm a very social person, and you like to go out, then it's obviously going to be very difficult for you to sit in meditation. If your senses are really attracted to food and other objects, then the senses will always go outwards. And so it's very difficult also to sit in meditation. The body will get restless and that's going to be hard. So we need to do an ongoing process of training our senses as well as the other aspects of the mind through awareness. And so pratyahar is not just stuffing your ears with some earplugs and closing your eyes and sitting in a dark room while those things may be useful to some people. That is not what is meant here. It means the process of training the senses so that they recede and move inwards. Any questions regarding the senses and how to train them? Okay, in that case, verse 55 basically explains that when you have achieved this pratyahar, that is the mastery over the senses. So, pratyahar is an important step that leads towards higher stages of meditation, and without that, it's not possible to continue. A restless mind and a restless body is not going to attain any higher state of meditation. So with that, we complete chapter 2, Samadhi Pada, uh, sorry, uh, Sadhana Pada of the Yoga Sutras. And then we come to chapter 3, Vibhuti Pada, that is on supernormal powers. A word of caution here. Now we are slowly coming to those parts of the Yoga Sutras that may be a little bit more difficult to understand. I will try my best to explain some difficult concepts in a way that everyone can relate to them using examples that we know from our daily life. All the same, some of these concepts are difficult if you've not had a direct experience of these higher states of meditation. <clears throat> if you do not understand something, you can always ask for clarification and I will try my best to see how we can um, clarify that. But we also need to accept that there may be things that we just have to let them sit with us. You know, just let them sit there and maybe sometime you get an insight and you say, aha, uh -huh, that's what it meant. The Yoga Sutra said this, right? Now I got it. 
So verses 1 to 4 of chapter 3 are the internal limbs, three internal limbs. So we know the first five limbs was yamas, niyamas, asan, pranayam, and pratyahar. And now we're going to talk about the three internal limbs. Verse 1, allowing the awareness to rest in a confined space and holding it there is dharana. Now those of you who have tried to do some sort of meditation, whether it's systematic or not, are familiar with the idea that you can focus your attention or awareness on the breath at Nasagre. Nasagre is that space between the two nostrils, say at the heart center, at the Adya Chakra, which is the spot between the eyebrows, or even at the navel chakra or center, which is basically abdominal breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. So you hold your attention in this space. This is, for example, a more neutral uh, object of meditation, that is the body itself or parts of the body. There may be other objects of meditation, external objects or internal objects like mantra. But all these are objects. And you may have noticed that when you try to focus your attention on any object, the mind keeps shifting. If you try to hold your attention at your heart center or at the Ajah Chakra or for that matter, the breath, you will notice that immediately within a, a couple of seconds, there might be a thought, a thought about, hmm, I have to go shopping and I've, I, I need to pick up some milk. Or another random thought after another two minutes, you will have a thought like, mm, all right, I, after I, you know, before I go to bed, I've got to do this and this and this, write some emails to, to some people. So all these kind of random thoughts come up when in fact what you want to do is allow your awareness to stay within that space. But it's, you notice it's hard. It's hard, it's not very easy because the mind is moving. The body may be still if you have mastered an asana and you have asana siddhi in a meditative posture, but the mind is moving still. And that unsteady mind still, or the mind which is not able to hold a thought for a longer time, is dharna. It is compared to uh, pouring water out of a bottle. When you pour water out of a bottle, it comes always out in spurts. You know, it doesn't flow smoothly. It comes out in spurts. So that is in a way, how our awareness is in dharana. You may have observed this even in other aspects of your daily life. When you were a student and you were studying and you were trying to focus on your textbook and instead your thoughts were with your friends and you were thinking about uh, perhaps a romantic infatuation that you had and the mind kept coming and disturbing you. And you will found it very hard to concentrate on, on your studies. So we all know that struggle that we go through when we want to concentrate on something. In fact, these days, it has become a bit of a chronic problem because we are so surrounded by devices of all kinds that are continuously vying for our attention that it's very hard for us to be focused on any one thing for a longer period of time. So what we are doing essentially is training a multi-pointed mind most of the time. 
which makes it even more difficult for such a mind to stay within a confined space and hold the attention there. If the object is interesting, maybe it's more, it's easier to hold the attention. So if you go, uh, if you're reading a book, you know, um, maybe a crime story, it's very interesting and uh, you're fully absorbed there, then it's very likely that that you're not thinking about other things and your mind is not rapidly moving. But it's purely external object. And such objects are not suitable for meditation. For meditation as in for purposes of yoga. Please remember that the power of the mind meditation, you can meditate upon anything. So if you want to write a poem, write poetry, then you meditate on certain thoughts and your mind flows with those thoughts and you can write poetry. If you want to paint or for matter do anything in life to achieve something, we need to have some focus. We need to be able to let the mind dwell with these thoughts for a longer period of time. And through this, we are aware of dharana in our external world as well. So we do dharana also when we are, for example, cooking or driving. And while driving, you may suddenly have some random thoughts in your head or you start talking to your person, uh, the person sitting next to you. And that is also a form of dharana. Why is it that these thoughts come up or images, maybe even emotions, fears, desires, all come up and disturb you when you're trying to focus on the breath? because the mind has not been purified yet. There are a lot of kleshas. We talked about that, right? Early in chapter one and two, there are kleshas, this is coloring. And the moment the body is a bit still and the breath is a little karma, these thoughts come up and disturb you and do not allow you to concentrate. So the importance of training the senses coordinating these four aspects of the mind keeps coming again and again when we experience a great deal of frustration in focusing on the object of concentration. So when you're not prepared really well and you receive a mantra and you try to concentrate, what is the result of that? The result is frustration or the result is Suppression. Very often, beginners who have not been prepared by some teachers or those who pick up mantras from books, for example, and start practicing without guidance, they think mantra means just repeat, repeat, repeat. So they use a lot of willpower or they use certain energy that comes from Ahankara to continue that practice of repetition, but somehow that does not lead to any progress. And the reason is that the purification has not been done, the training has not happened, the ground has not been prepared. So mantra is a seed. You have to prepare the ground so that this seed will grow. So dharana is a very important aspect since Almost all those people who say that they're meditating are generally not even meditating. They are sort of floating um, in a sort of a battle which is happening in the mind. There are all sorts of thoughts and images, emotions, fears, desires, everything coming up, getting even more active the more you try to love them the mind and the attention to focus in a certain space, in a, in a confined space. The mind just does not want to do it.
Any questions about dharana or anything we talked about right now, like objects of meditation, purification? And then we come to verse 2. Verse 2 is Dhyana. When the awareness rests in this confined space, such that the attention flows steadily within this confined space without interruption, it is known as Dhyana. Now imagine that this awareness you succeed in purifying to a certain extent so that these thoughts, images, emotions, etc. do not keep disturbing you. You have a sense of calmness and you're able to stay with that object of awareness or meditation for a slightly longer period of time. And this Attention or awareness flows uninterrupted. The, descript, the, the symbol or the analogy is that of oil. When you pour oil out of a bottle, it flows very smooth. Quite different from pouring water out of a bottle, which flows in spurts, the oil always flows out very smooth. And so, Dhyana is attention that is maintained for a longer period of time and acquires a feeling of flow. It's the same thought rising again and again, and it seems to be like one thought being in your mind all the time. We know this kind of dhyana in certain situations in our life which I can only describe right now as maybe negative, such as fear. If you are very afraid of something, some people have an absolutely obsessive fear, say, of snakes. And if you are in nature, in the wild, and you're just constantly thinking of snakes all the time, what you're doing is the mind is meditating on snakes, on that object of fear. Anger is another example. When you're so angry with somebody that you cannot let go of that anger, you're just no longer thinking even of the person after a while. You just have a big ball of red anger sitting in your heart and you begin to, to feel that that is just all that's there. You know, the person somehow has almost vanished. And this kind of meditation would be meditation actually on anger. You would be doing dhyana on anger. So you see that we do know what dhyana is, but in a negative sense. What about attachment to, say, your child or your partner? You're so attached. When that person is not there, or you know, when you're infatuated as a teenager, your first love, and you keep thinking about this person and you're only thinking about this person all the time so the image of the person is even gone and you just have this feeling and then that is again an example of dhyana and so this is an experience that all of us have had so we do have an idea what dhyana is but we have a hard time doing it with neutral more neutral objects such as the breath or the heart center or the, the ajya chakra because all other thoughts keep coming and disturbing us you may have experienced some form of dhyana when you went to the dentist and he was working on one of your teeth and uh, you experience pain 
And initially, you try not to experience the pain by trying to not focus on it and avoid letting your mind rest in the pain. You try to distract yourself. You know, you look at the ceiling and they generally have something hanging on the ceiling and you try to not pay attention. That is dharna. Your mind is actually pulling you to the pain, but you're trying to take it somewhere else. So that back and forth, that's a kind of dharna. But when you give up that battle, the pain just becomes too much. It's overwhelming. You, 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 you forget everything else in the room. And now your mind is only focused on that drilling that's happening in your tooth and, and the pain. And then you just, you cannot think of anything else because that pain has captured you in a sense. So in a sense, you're, that's where you're going, you know, towards dhyana and maybe even towards something deeper. I'm using these examples to help you understand what the difference between dharana and dhyana is. Samadhi is slightly different. So it's important to understand what the object of concentration is. You don't necessarily want to meditate upon your anger or upon your, the attachment to your child or your partner or meditate upon your fears. Because as we will find out, you take on those qualities. If you meditate upon anger, the anger will get stronger. So it's important to understand this, that the object of meditation is important. Sometimes external objects are chosen. Many people like to use idols or icons of, of religious icons. And some of them are very positive because they are qualities of compassion, love, etc. And that may be useful, but you have to be aware that as awareness keeps moving inwards, <clears throat> these kind of objects will not be able to take you deeper inside and you will have to leave them behind. So even the breath eventually you would have to leave behind. Which is why mantra is a far more subtler object of concentration because the breath cannot go into the mind, but the mantra goes and takes us through the different layers of the mind. And you hold on to the, to the mantra and <clears throat> let your awareness rest with the mantra. Any questions about dhyana? Dhyana is generally just translated as meditation. In, unfortunate because that has led to some misunderstandings. Everybody who says, oh, I'm meditating now, is not necessarily attaining this level of meditation. Dhyana is a technical word, so, and it is a fairly uh, advanced stage in meditation requires certain preparation and training. Interesting also would be uh, to know that the word dhyana, then as, as meditation practices, tantra, yoga, etc., went from India to China, Tibet, and from China, Tibet, it went to Japan, etc., it was called from dhyana, it turned to jhyana, and from jhyana, it became zen. So the word zen, the original uh, root of that is the word dhyan. It makes, this sounds similar, dhyan and zen. <laughs> it may not sound very similar anymore, but it, it shifted from dhyan to shuan, 
something like that in Chinese, and then from that into Zen. So that's where the idea comes in Zen Buddhism, where there is uh, meditation on the breath, breath awareness. That comes from here. So verse 3 is Samadhi. That's what we've all been waiting for. And these would be the three internal limbs, as they're called. Samadhi. When awareness keeps flowing in an unbroken stream within that one confined space, eventually the entire mind is absorbed such that only the object of meditation shines forth and the witness witnesses the mind. This is known as samadhi. It's a long sentence. <laughs> I was not able to find a, a better way of you know, putting it maybe in two parts, but it didn't quite work. So when the entire mind is absorbed in an unbroken stream in that confined space, could be the space between the eyebrows. The whole mind is absorbed in such a way that everything else seems to disappear. There is only that light there. When we talk about the space between the eyebrows, we're not talking about the external space outside, the physical space outside, but we're talking about an ex internal space between the eyebrows. It's internal, it's inside, not external, not on the body, not physically on the body. So similarly, when we talk about the heart center, we are not talking about the external physical part that you see, like that space on your body itself, but you're talking about a space within, that is the heart center. So when your awareness is there, the whole body, sorry, the whole mind is absorbed in that so that everything else just seems to dissolve away, disappears, and only that object remains, nothing else. What happens here is very interesting, for which I will go to our diagram. So if here we're focusing the mind, the entire mind is focused on, on a certain space, what happens suddenly is that it seems that there's a kind of a, a break here. And the center of consciousness suddenly starts witnessing, becomes aware or it's always aware, but you identify with it now and you see the mind itself has taken on the qualities of that object. So if it is focused on the heart center, it seems to be just the heart center and it's watching from here, from this point here, from the center of consciousness. It's witnessing. And so there seems to be a separation suddenly, and this separation is called viyog. Such a person experiences or might say, oh, I am not my body. The body and the mind is different, because everybody else is identified either with the body or with the mind, mostly the conscious mind. But when you've had this glimpse of samadhi, it has to be only a glimpse. And if it's an intense enough glimpse, you will experience this separateness and witness. So the mind has now taken on these objects, the quality. So for example, to use those uh, examples that I used in, for the earlier verse, 
anger. If you're focusing on anger, you become anger. If you're focusing on a fearful object, you become fear. Which is exactly why it's important that the object of concentration is chosen carefully. Creative persons experience this quite often, very spontaneously, when they are creating a work of art or writing, and they suddenly have this very intense concentration, and then it flows into maybe into poetry or art, and then suddenly they see the separation, and they they describe it like this. They, they will say, I didn't write the book or I didn't paint this painting. It just happened. And why are they doing that? Because they see in that intense concentration that they are not the mind. It's the mind that's this wonderful genie. You know, it's a little lamp which comes out of the lamp, you know, this... Uh, Thing and it creates all sorts of wonderful things. So it's this wonderful Aladdin's lamb, and the mind creates all sorts of beautiful things, and they see that. This happens also in mystical experiences, and when that happens, you become a mystic. It can happen very spontaneously to people. Um, quite innocently, not intending to have any sort of uh, higher meditative state, it just happens sometimes to people, whether it's grace or whatever it is, sometimes that happens, and when that happens, their lives change. It turns their lives sometimes upside down, because everything they thought was important earlier probably is no longer important to them anymore. So when that experience happens and it's intense enough, it will change your life completely. But many of us have had these experiences. They are called fleeting samadhis. And in fleeting samadhis also, you, you go through these things, but they are fleeting in nature, so you may not really, you know, Register it. It was not powerful enough. How can we attain this kind of samadhi if our minds are not purified? That kind of concentration is very difficult if the mind is not purified. If you have an object like a work of art or, or something, perhaps that happens easier. But... To do this process internally is much harder and you find that it's because you cannot sustain that kind of willpower for a longer period of time. Your thoughts, images, emotions which have not been purified will start pouring in again and the witness will withdraw behind the veil again. So it takes a lot of willpower, and that cannot be sustained. So the only option that remains is purification, training. When you experience this samadhi, however brief it may be, you experience the witness, your true nature, and you ask, Suddenly, this question, who am I? Because you were earlier identified with a conscious mind. And now, you are suddenly, even though it was very brief, you will be identifying with the center of consciousness. It's a new experience. And you ask yourself, who am I? This question comes repeatedly. It surfaces. And you long to go back to that experience or state of samadhi. Such a seeker is called an adhikari because he has already had a glimpse. So his longing is very intense. His faith is very 
strong because he has he doesn't have doubts. He has only experienced it once. When he reads these books, he is not confused because he knows this is the truth. He's already experienced it. He doesn't have to just have blind faith in the words of scriptures or saints and the like. He knows. So, we have covered the first three verses of chapter 3. And that's a very good place to stop. We shall continue our um, the next session on Friday, next Friday. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Yaji. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Yeah, well, thank you, Perry. I'm very happy that you're enjoying this. Very nice weekend to everybody. Bye, Debbie. Manita. Bye-bye, Jenny. Bye, John.